Yosemite National Park in California, United States, is perhaps one of the most beautiful sceneries in the world to be viewed by any person. Its massive rock walls acting like a shield to the outside world, featuring beautiful landmarks such as El Capitan, a massive granite monolith popular for rock climbing and photography. Other landmarks include Cathedral Peak and the Bravito Falls. This truly amazing work of nature with all of its beauty holds a truly horrifying past and present story though. Today on The Spook Report, we will go over the history of missing people in the Yosemite National Park and why these disappearances stand out as strange. As you first enter the valley leading into Yosemite National Park, you can't help but feel small. It's a wonder all around you, world's creation, the perfect example of nature's ability to create wonders that man could never even imagine. The vastness of the valleys and the cliff faces and the landscape as you follow the road alongside the murked river coming into the valley view is bewildering. I will never forget my first time visiting the park in August of 2014. I had been stationed in Japan for the last two to three years when I was being medically retired. They flew me out to California for the Veteran Affairs out processing. During my time in California, I had the great fortune of meeting a elderly gentleman who was also in the military. Now, we would never have had the chance to meet, be friends, or anything like that while in the military. But seeing as we both were being medically retired, he looked past rank, he looked past age, and he took me under his wing. We both were in a bad place and we wanted to just get the most out of life while we could. So during those two weeks when we weren't being medically out processed or having appointments or poked and prodded, he would invite me out on an adventures. And one day he told me that when he was a young boy, this was 40 years before, he had the chance to go to Yosemite National Park with his parents. He wanted to see it again and he was still nervous about his medical condition. He had had a heart attack. and. He was being retired for that, and he was still nervous that, you know, something might act up, and he wanted someone to go with him. And uh, I also had medical issues, and I wanted to go, and I wanted someone to look out for me. So we became brothers. Despite that age and rank difference, he took me in, and we looked out for each other. So one morning, we had no appointment set up. We decided to set out for Yosemite National Park. It was a several-hour drive, but when we finally arrived, to say that I was all struck is the understatement of a life. As we came in through the valley and El Capitan shined in the sunlight reflecting back on its granite walls, I was blown away. I had been all around the world. I have traveled, explored, and never in my life have I seen such natural beauty in this vastness. We took the day and we hiked the trails, we walked around, got a feel for the area, and it's easy to see how someone could get hurt out there and lost. But at the same time, there was many factors that, you know, would make you think that it wouldn't be easy. Most of these trails are paved. They're heavily packed with people. There's rails everywhere. It is a national park that is heavily maintained. The natural formation of Yosemite National Park is almost like a bowl. No matter where you go once you enter the valley following the river, there are sheer rock cliffs. Now, there are some very remote areas at Yosemite National Park, some that probably people have never been to to this day. However, some of these areas where people have disappeared in the park are on well-paved trails, very populated. It is a, one of the most popular tourist destinations in California, perhaps. Now, this is where the strange disappearances just don't add up, as well as the National Park Service's system for tracking these things. And in today's video, we're going to go over some missing 411 cases, and we're going to talk about why these stand out and why they're strange. Additionally, we're going to talk about the National Park Service's failures that have been brought up. I hope you enjoy. Let's get into the cases. If there's anything that you take from these videos that I create and sharing information on missing 411 or strange stories in general is, is that major news organizations, federal agencies in the form of law enforcement, state law enforcement, etc., you know, the media in general, they do not cover in-depth detail 
these strange disappearances as soon as they fall out of that norm or there's strange factors in it they don't really want to cover it they only want to get that bulletin news print in get their views and they're done with it one of the beautiful things about the missing 411 community is that people get together they share information and they actually do the research now missing 411 comes from david politis you know he's an amazing man he was a former detective we've gone over this in other videos but he has said in interviews that when he reaches out to a lot of these state parks and asks for their database on missing people they just don't have it and they say it's too expensive or you know which we all know is not true it's not hard to have a database in this modern time now the importance of having a database in tracking these missing people is, is that you don't know what's causing it you need to gather as much information as possible when you have missing people you want to know the date they disappeared their age their sex the location they disappeared who they were with any important information and as other people disappear you add those to the database and then you're able to automatically link things together a lot quicker for all you know there could be a, a little boy or a little girl disappearing in this one particular location every few years and you would have no idea what the linking factors could be. Sure, they could just get lost in the woods and pass away, or a tour guide might be the same tour guide, and then you can start linking that information together and have a definitive you know, look at what could be a possibility. It may not be supernatural. It may not be something strange. It could be human behavior, and this is why it's so important and why the National Park Service needs to get their stuff together and actually start looking at it because there's a tremendous amount of missing people cases in our national parks and there's just something strange about it so we're gonna go over some very strange missing 411 cases we're gonna discuss their stories and afterwards we're just gonna have a general talk about why these things stand out so we'll go ahead and get into those stories now Christopher Andrews went missing on October 3, 2008, in the Iceland area of Immigrant Wilderness, California. He was 42 years of age at the time of his disappearance. Christopher was married to his wife, Amy Andrews, and lived in a wealthy community in Hillsborough, California. Christopher had been employed by the tech giant, Oracle Corporation, and had even left school one semester early to take the job. He was doing very well in life and was very happy with his circumstances. In October, he decided to take a five-day break from work and go to the Immigrant Wilderness area in north of Yosemite National Park. He was an experienced and avid hiker. He was very safety conscious. During his hikes, he would also be carrying with him a personal safety transponder, where in an emergency, he could be able to set it off and give emergency responders his exact location via GPS. On October 3rd, his transponder sent an emergency signal via satellite to first responders. The location was Iceland Lake at 7,200 feet elevation. The area he had been hiking in was open and clear, relatively safe to travel between his entry and end destination. For some reason, though, Christopher had chose, during very extreme weather, to climb a granite spire to send out a signal. The rescue had been delayed a day due to extreme weather, a common theme in the missing 411 cases. They would not be able to get to him for a day. As an experienced hiker, he would know being up high during bad weather was not a safe place to be. The trail he was hiking on had many locations where he could seek shelter and be protected from the elements. Again, this was a large open area between where he entered to his end goal. There were many areas that could protect him from lightning, rain, wind, and the elements in general. The next day, a helicopter would go to the area of the distress signal to look for Christopher. They searched and they could not locate him. As they continued to search, the weather began to clear more. He would later be found wedged at the bottom of a crevasse near the spire Christopher had climbed. They believed he had fallen to his death, possibly by stepping on a wet rock and slipping. There is a massive amount of reports that show similar situation and where a hiker who is solo is found deceased upon going to a place they should not have been. An experienced hiker such as Christopher chose to leave the path to safety during extreme weather to climb up a granite spire placing himself in even more danger. When the clearing below had plenty of options of safety from the elements. 
There was no signal loss from the spire to the ground, and yet he decided to make the choice. We confronted this information, we have to ask ourselves, why and what would cause him to make such a choice? Think about it. He's in a large open clear area. It's a very laid out well path that he can go from point A to point B. At some point during his travel, the weather rolls in, it's getting fairly bad, but this should still not affect his emergency transponders signal. He's also experienced. He knows where to seek shelter, where to protect himself from the elements, but something made him go up a granite spire. Uh, instead of staying in the open where he was on his trail, he made the decision to climb up a granite spire in inclement weather, bad weather, and set off his signal. And there are many cases in which this is a uh, similar circumstances happen. There is no explanation for why he did it. I suspect that, like in my other videos, this is one of those cases where we should ask ourselves why and what. What could have caused Christopher to leave the safety of the clearing and the trail to go to the top of the thing? First question I ask myself is, is he trying to get a signal? Well, if he had no signal loss on the ground and he was climbing up to the top, then there was no point for that. During bad weather, why would he want to go up there for sightseeing or to do something? It doesn't make any sense. He's, he's safety conscious. That leaves me with what? I suspect something that Christopher came across may have scared him so badly that he chose to make that decision where he had no other choice if he were to continue on that path. His life was in more danger than climbing up a granite spire in the middle of bad weather and use his emergency responder to get help. To me, that is classic missing 411 uh, situation. Uh, there was no reason for him to do it, yet he still chose to do it. So then we are left with asking ourselves that, you know, those questions. And that is what I've coming up with this particular case. Stacy Ann Arras went missing on July 17, 1981. She was just 14 years old at the time of her disappearance. If there is any missing 411 story from the Yosemite area that should spell out the dangers and the concerns that people should have, it would be this one. Stacy was with her father and a group of 10 people that included a guide who was very well experienced as they went on a horseback trail through the wilderness. They stopped for lunch near the Cathedral Lake they all sat down, had a meal, and they would continue on to Sunrise High Sierra Camp, where they would stop for the night. Stacy had some aches from riding all day to the camp, but she's young and she has a lot of energy, and she got a quick shower, and then she asked her father if she could go on a quick hike. It was about a 1.5 mile hike from the camp, and you could still see the location from the camp. And her father agreed, but told her she needed to take her flip flop off and slip over to uh, hiking shoes. She agreed. It would be at this time that a man named Gerald Stewart, who was 70 years old, volunteered to go with Stacy. He was part of the group. The father agreed, and the two would travel across giant slabs of granite with small clusters of trees nearby and lakes all around the area. After a few minutes, Gerald would become a little tired. He's an older man, and he would tell Stacy, hey, I need to sit down and rest for a moment. Stacy agreed and understood, and she stayed fairly close. She just wanted to go hike up a little bit further and go on a boulder and look at the views. It would be at this time that the camp guide back at the camp, who was taking care of the horses in the corral, would look up and remember seeing Stacy standing on a boulder, walking towards the sunset, and that would be the last time anyone would ever see Stacy again. Now, there's a lot of strange situations in the Stacy Eros case. The search would last nine days only, and it would encompass 8,000 man hours, 57 helicopter hours, and four agencies working together in the search. Over the span of nine days, and if you break down that 8,000 hours of searching, you can tell that there was a lot of people involved in the search for her, including her family. She would not be the only one to disappear from this location. There would also be other situations. Uh, I believe it was in 1968, a man was found laying against a boulder, deceased, by two off-duty police officers who happened to be hiking that area for the day. 
and he had no gear with him. He was just absolutely only in his clothes, deceased against the boulder. They never were able to identify him. Later on, it would be in... 1976, a man named Jeff Estes disappeared in the same exact location. No traces of him were ever found. In 1981, we had the Stacy's missing event. Within four to five, I think it was four years later, Timothy Barnes would also disappear in this area with zero trace. What I want you to picture in your mind is a relatively flat area filled with boulders and some trees and some lakes. Two, three miles across, you can see as far as you can, you know, see kind of thing. We have a description from the camp guide who remembered seeing Stacy standing on the boulder from the camp, so he could still see her from the camp. During that entire search, not a single clue was found of any of these people. This area is surrounded by high mountain cliffs. There would be no reason to go up those, but they act like artificial walls to keep people in. Why did they give up searching for Stacy after only nine days? She wouldn't have left that area. It's not like a city where if a child is kidnapped, they could be 100 miles away by the end of the day due to, you know, the roads and transportation. That is not an option out here. Everyone who has disappeared in this small area has to still be there. However, no traces were ever found. And we still have the unidentified male that was found. No information, no idea how he got there, no gear whatsoever. What makes this case even stranger is the fact that the National Park Service, almost 40 years later, still will not release any information on Stacy's case. The only information we have gotten is is that Stacy is not ha- there's no suspects in the Stacy's case. That there is a uh, emphasis that she is a missing person, not an abducted person or anything like that. However, they still will not release the case files to anyone who attempts to get that information. Additionally, Stacy was uh, 14 years of age. She was not far away from Gerald, who was with her. Uh, he said that she walked off and just went outside of view for a few minutes and he never saw her again. It's a truly strange disappearance, and we'll go into more situations like this in this particular area in a later video, but just really emphasize on the fact that there was nowhere for them to go, all right? They're surrounded by walls, essentially, yet their bodies have never been found, and over 8,000 man hours were spent going through that. Nothing was found, a shoe, a shirt, signs of, you know, an attack, nothing. They just disappeared without a trace in an area that a lot of people have the exact same situation occurring. Not a lot adds up. To me, one of the stranger things about this situation is, is that in 1986, a law was passed that all children who disappear in the United States need to be added to a database. As of 2022, Stacey Abrams was not on that database. When questioned by David Politis on with the National Park Service why she was not on there, they got really defensive and a apparently angry and uh, did not believe him one of the excuses we heard was is that um, you know she disappeared in 1981 before the law was passed yet there are hundreds of children from the 40s the 50s the 60s and 70s that are on the missing child database yet Stacy's remains off of it she is also you know no information is being released on her disappearance it's it's very strange you have to ask yourself what are they covering up why why are they doing that these are questions you have to ask yourself i am not going to speculate other than talk about the general circumstances in which these disappearances happen and the strange things that link them all together when you look at the map of people who have disappeared in yosemite you will notice it is a massive cluster yes it's a great deal of wilderness unpopulated Many things could be occurring in this area, and there are, you know, some fringe thoughts people have, and I'm not going to go into it in this video. I just wanted to tell the story of Stacy and Christopher Andrews and their disappearances. And once again, in these Missing 411 stories, it's just there's no explanation. Um, the fact that 40 years down the road in this small area, we still have not found signs of the bodies of four people in this one spot. There are others... There's probably people we don't even know about that have disappeared from this area. But the ones we do know, a sign should have popped up by now. 
Someone should have stumbled across something. And yet, we don't have it. Those are the stories that I have for you today on the Spook Report. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, just remember these are human beings who disappeared, and have reverence for that, and, you know, love your family, and know that, you know, be extra careful. Even in the case of Christopher Andrews, who took safety to a high degree, and even had, a, during a time when it wasn't as common, a safety transponder he took out on his hike, even setting it off, he still ended up being deceased. Be vigilant. Be careful and just, you know, <laughs> value your your circumstances. Be comfortable, but always keep an open mind to the unknowns. What could have happened to these people? As always, I wish you all the best, and let me know what you guys think is going on in these situations. You know, let's have a discussion. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. Have a great day, and if you don't mind, if you can hit the like button, if you enjoyed the video, subscribe. If you want more content like this, this is Zach from the Sruka Report. I hope you have a great day. Take care.